Thank you very much, Geoffrey. I tell you what, I want to echo what Mona said because this is a great room to read poetry in, it really is, and to listen to that wonderful band. And me and the band have had an idea that at the end I thought we might try something together because we never met before. And we think, well, that's what poetry and jazz is all about, isn't it? So at the end we'll do something. And also, it's great to read with Mona because I think she's a fantastic poet. I think the job of the poet is to refresh and revitalise the language, and that's what Mona does in her book. If you can get it, it's fantastic. And the new stuff, you think, I can't wait for the next book. And the other Friday, three things happened to me that kind of crystallised something I've been thinking about for a bit. I was on my way to Morecambe to do a show in Morecambe at this venue called The Platform. And I was sat on the train, I was talking to a fella next to me. And as we got off the train in Lancaster to get to go to Morecambe, this fella said, I recognise your voice. I says, oh yeah. He said, I think I've heard you on the radio. I says, oh yeah. I says, yeah, you might have. He says, you are Count Arthur Strong. I says, I says I've got news for you, my friend. Uh, he's a fictional construct. And I'm a real life human being. He went, oh yeah. I said, yeah, Ian Macmillan, he went, ah, oh, no, and he shook his head, he said, no, oh, no, 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 that's true. And then, I got off the train, on the little train that goes from Lancaster to Morecambe, and I was really happy, I'm always happy when I'm on my way to do a show. And I was sat there, and I was just so happy. Then I stood up, and I'd been sat on some chewing gum, so I kind of stuck to the seat, and I thought, you know, I am becoming a fictional character. I am becoming a character who appears in my own poems. So somehow, because as Jeffrey said, I've been writing for a long time, you end up becoming the person that's in your poems. And then, when I got off the train in Morecambe, this chap came up to me and said, Ian Macmillan? I said, yeah. He said, you're on at the platform in Morecambe tonight? I said, yes, I am. He said, the show starts at half past seven? I said, yeah. He said, it finishes about nine o'clock? I said, that's right. He said, you're going to be reading some poems and talking about them? I said, yes. He said, the tickets are £10. I said, that's right. He said, I'm not coming. And I said, to be honest with you, that's fine by me because I've become a person in my own poems. And so, when I read the poems, when I read the poems out, I think, actually, the person that's in the poems probably isn't me. Isn't me anymore. And I like to read a few about from new stuff and then maybe a bit of old stuff. But I was thinking about the newer work has seemed to concentrate on the place I'm from. I've always lived in the same place. It's a place called Darfield, near Barnsley. And I've always lived there. And I just want to read a few pieces about Darfield. And the first one is about my Uncle Charlie. My Uncle Charlie was a very interesting fella. His, his hobby was photography, but he never took people. He said, what's the point of taking people? You can see them on the bus. Yeah, that's true. And he said, there's no point taking scenes, because you can see them out at window. So what he actually took was famous people off the telly. That was what he took. So I had these memories of these photographs that he took. And he had, they had this old, him and my auntie had this old television from the court that he'd rented with, thick, with spindly thin legs and a ball of fruit on the top. And whenever, and he had his phone, his, his camera set up in front of the telly. And when somebody famous came on, he'd take the picture. So I had pictures of, uh, of Muhammad Ali, and I had pictures of Prince Philip, and I had pictures of Harry Worth, and I had pictures of Dickie Valentine. And I said, why are you taking those pictures, Charlie? And he said, because such as that, I'll never come to Barnsley. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And also, his other thing was chess. He loved playing chess, but he called it chest. And his thing was, he said that, he's th and I'll, explain, I'll talk about it in the poem, he said that any piece could move in any direction and do anything it wanted to, including sometimes swapping the pieces for random bits of stuff that he found in the house. And so this is about that. And, it's, it's, and also it's about a terrible thing that happened to his wife, my auntie, at this moment when we were playing that. And he was a big fan of Nye Bevan, my Uncle Charlie. He's always quoted Nye Bevan to me. So it's called Playing Chess with Uncle Charlie. Well, for a start, he called it chest. And he said that any piece could move in any direction and take any other piece in any way it wanted to, including flicking them off the board or wrapping them in a rubber band. It changed from black to white on a whim. And once he made a hill of sugar on the corner square for that castle thing to hide behind, he said. His eyes big behind those glasses that magnified so much for so long with such love. Once we were playing in the back room 
He just substituted a park drive for a pawn. And he was listening along to sing something simple. So it must have been Sunday. And in the kitchen, unknown to us, my auntie had just glugged from a bleach bottle thinking it was lemonade. I know, he was holding forth, continuing my political education. Bevan got it right, Ian. Lower than vermin, that's what they are, lower than vermin. And he put my king in his waistcoat pocket and said, check it him mate, Ian, check it him mate. In the kitchen, my auntie was gasping for breath. Uncle Charlie couldn't read or write, left school too soon, went straight down the pit. I once tried to teach him, but my Janet and John embarrassed us both. So we got the chessboard out and never mentioned it again. He put a hat on the bishop made from an eggshell. All those things are true and what happened was, my auntie had always said, never drink from the bottle. But then for reasons unknown to me and Uncle Charlie, she decanted some bleach from a, from a tin into this lemonade bottle. And she drank it in the kitchen while we were playing chess. And it was like that bit out of the full Monty because she came out gasping for breath. And my uncle Charlie said, what's, are you all right? And she went, I'm not so bad on myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I wish I was making this up. I wish I was making some of this up. Because that's what you end up doing. You end up, you end up writing these things. And you think, I wish, I wish I'd made some of it up. I wish some of it was made up. Because strange things happen to me all the time. And I just, I just write them down. I just sit there and write them down. So the other uncle I'd like to talk about is my Uncle Jack. My Uncle Jack was from Hillsborough in Sheffield. And he was what we called a D-Dar. That's what bars of people call Sheffielders because they have an interesting accent where they put a hard D rather than a soft D. So they go, Daddy, Daddy, what are doing, dear, dear? What are you doing? What are you doing, dear, dear? And also, the way they speak is wonderful linguistically. They have a very wide A. Daddy, Daddy, I'm not going to park the car in car park. And my Uncle Jack, in 1961, when I was five, we, went, we always went to Uncle Jack's at Boxing Day. I went to Uncle Jack's in 1961, and he bought these fake joke jam tarts. And he got these fake joke jam tarts. They went, Daddy, does they want a tart? And he went, thanks, Jack. And, they, and they go, he beat me because he up the rubber rooms. And he knew it, he thought it was so funny. And then, because it went down well, he did it every year. <laughs> For about 15 years, every boxing day. Harry, does that want to die? No, Harry, Jack. He was a bit rubbery, Jack. And, us. and then that was always a signal for me dad to put his trilby on and say, I think each time he went home. It was like when he gets the tarts out. We tried to get to go home before he got the tarts out. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if I tried to write a poem about that, that actually finished the poem before he got the tarts out? <laughs> in a kind of postmodernist meta way. So I thought, I'll, I'll see if I can do it. And as you can hear, I don't manage it. I don't manage to do it. The other thing about Uncle Jack was, he was in the Western Desert in the Second World War, and he was sat on this sand dune Western Desert in 1942. He could never remember what year, thought he was 42, 43. And the American general, Mark Clark, went past in a Jeep, and my Uncle Charlie went, Harry, and I that dear Mark Clark. And he went, I am that soldier. He says, well, fighting's that way. Because <laughs> being a general is going the wrong way for fainting, like they always do. <laughs> so it's called Uncle Jack's Rubber Tarts Boxing Day 1964. So we'd already three years into Boxing Day. Thing. Better get the poem written quickly before the rubber tarts come out. We've had tea, we're having a bun or a tart before we go on from Mark Liff Road. Uncle Jack is talking about when he saw the American general Mark Clark driving the wrong way away from the fighting back in 42 or 43. He can't remember or won't which year. I says to him, Daddy, General Mark Clark, fighting's that way, I know they're going the wrong way for fighting. The Sheffield A's met the name Mark Clark ring like a bell. Hurry up, darts will be out soon. Ah, I flirt a bit communist party, we all did. Daddy, would you like a tart before you go? Too late. Rubber tarts are out. Bite them. Bite them. Outside, snow falls like a reminder that language is always going to be the battleground. The fighting's that way, you know, because it's always struck me all through my life that language is, it really is the battleground. But then, looking back over some older poems, you do get fed up with your own poems. I started writing what I called Bonanza or Diagnosis Murder style poems because at the end of Bonanza, there's always a bit at the end when they explain what's just happened. And it's the same in Diagnosis Murder. At the end, they go, by the way, that happened. And a lot of my poems ended up being like that. The first four verses would be kind of the poem. Then the last verse would be, if you didn't spot it, this is what it's about. 
And the first verse is often you kind of getting ready with <laughs> here comes the poem. I always said to people in writing workshops, lose the first verse, lose the last verse, keep the middle bit. That's always my advice. And so I thought, right, what I'll do is I'll write a poem about whatever happens when I walk in the house. I'll walk in the house, I won't alter a thing, whatever happens, I'll write it down. This is quite an old poem because it features my son, the award-winning poet, as a young lad. And I'll talk you through the poem, then I'll read it. And what happened was, I thought, right, I'm not going to make anything up. And it was a hot night, I remember that. And I walked in the house, and there was this massive moth flying around the room, about as big as a dog. The biggest moth you've ever seen in your life. And my wife was trying to flick it out of the door with this bra that she'd taken out of the washing machine. And she's like that, with this bra trying to flick the moth. And I thought, there's no point making anything up, is there? There's no point making anything up. And so she says, come and give me a hand with this moth, she says. So I tried to walk across the room, but I found myself stuck to the floor because Andrew, as a little boy, had been playing under the ironing board with some of my dad's fishing wire. So I'm stuck like that, and I come move so I'm like that, and my wife's like that with a bra. And then one of my daughters came in, and she says, it's time for the hedgehog. And we all went like that. Because for a month that summer, a hedgehog walked past our house at the same time every night. And we all stood and watched it because very little happens in the Dern Valley. And, and, I, and I've been married for 36 years and my wife is a very sound sleeper. But that night, for some mysterious reason that I can't fathom, she sat up in bed and she went, the big wheel is going round. And went back to sleep. And I thought, there's no point making anything up, ever. No point, no point. And the next day, I was on this bus and it was a really warm day and it felt like there was going to be a storm and this fellow behind me on the bus, he went, there's a storm in the air. And his mate says, aye, best place for it. I thought, aye, fantastic. Put that in your poem, Macmillan. And then, I was at this school doing a thing in a school and this little boy came up to me, a little junior lad, and he was really excited. He says, he wanted to tell me something. He says, you know that poem, that song, the sun has got his hat on? I said, yeah. He says, it means it's cloudy. I thought, God, that's so clever. So I put that in the poem. And then just for a joke, when I sent it off to the publisher, I thought I'll call it poem containing several REM song titles. And there's none in it. And the publisher rang up and said, I can only find three. I've not got all the albums, so. So this is it, and I think when you've met me and Mona tonight, you'll have been sprinkled with a kind of poetic dust. So when you leave the room tonight, things will happen to you. Strange and wonderful poetic things will happen to you. Just write them down, just write them down. Sorry. I guarantee it, something will happen. So it's called Poem Containing Several R.E.M. Song Titles. It's a hot summer's evening. My wife flicks a moth out the door with her bra. It could have been my shirt or the Radio Times. The sun's got his hat on and the garden's almost dark. The hedgehog will be out soon. The big wheel's going round, says my wife, in a different place and a different time. I'd like to help with the moth, but I'm all tangled up with some fishing line that my son left under the ironing board. So I'm like a swan, tangled in the invisible knots that can choke you, or at least stop you flying. There's a storm somewhere in the air which is the best place for it. It's hard to be a moth, or a swan, or a hedgehog, or a big wheel. R.E.M. song titles, spot them all. There aren't any, of course, but there you go. And I was, I was thinking about, now that I'm 60, I often do think about the passage of time. Then I look back over these poems, because a lot of these are quite old. And you, I've been thinking about time for years, actually, for years and years. And I was once in a pub, and this fella turned to his mate, and he went, do you know, I used to be 37, and now I'm 51. I thought, you know, he's right. The years just fly by. They fly by. And what he meant was he was referring to his talk numbers. That's where he changed his talk numbers. And, and he was doing that thing where you can't bear not to eat the last crisp in the bag. And he was bashing bottom of the bag to the tomb. And I thought, that's life. That's how life goes. And I thought, I'm going to write about that. So I thought, again, whatever happens, I'll write it down. And at the time, me, our Andrew, when he was a baby, it was at that stage where he'd go around and he'd ask you how old you were and you'd tell him and he'd kind of repeat it, become obsessed with that idea of passing time. So that's in the poem as well. And also, I was writing the poem and I wanted to be receptive to whatever happened. And the phone rang as I'm writing the poem and this fellow said, you're late. I said, really? He said, yeah, they're all waiting. And he got the wrong number and he thought I was a wedding photographer. <laughs> wow. Put that in the poem. And then... My dad, unlike my Uncle Charlie, was the worst ever photographer because all my dad's photographs 
were so completely overexposed that they all looked like a photograph of a white tablecloth. There was nothing at all to see. But my dad would sit there looking at him for hours going, I love that campsite. And you'd have to kind of, you'd have to join in. You'd go, yeah, we're great, weren't you? And, and so my mum rang up and she said, I've just found some of your dad's old pictures. So we had to join in this kind of fantasy, looking at these white sheets going, oh, eh? I think the tide was in. And she went, oh, I think the tide was out. And it struck me. I mean, that's what we do when we write poems, that's what we do, we just look at these blank things, we just put our own things into them. So, just about that really, and the title, I'm always keen on, I like titles, I think titles shouldn't be too explanatory, and I think titles should sometimes send you up the garden path a bit, so that when you get to the poem you're in somewhere else. And I'd written the poem and I'd got a title, and my mate Jeff Hattersley, who used to run a wonderful magazine called The Wide Skirt, rang me up and he said, um, I've got a space in my magazine for a poem. Have you got a new poem? I said, yeah, I've just written a new poem. He said, have you got a title? I said, I can't think of a title. Can you tell me a title for this poem? And he went, no, I'd better not. So that's what I call it, I'd better not. And it seemed to fit somehow. So it's called, I'd better not, yeah, it seemed to fit. A man leaned over to a man in a pub and said in a voice, I used to be 37, but now I'm 51. And that's how the years go, in handfuls. Like somebody is almost at the end of a bag of crisps and they tip the bag up and it's as though they're drinking crisps. That's how the years go. Today, one of my daughters is 13. One of my daughters is 11. My son's eight, I'm 40. My wife's 41. My dad's 77. My mum's 74. That's how the years go. Very bleached is the grass on that coast. I was going to explain that, fill you in. I just had to answer the phone and somebody asked me if I was a photographer. Once, one of my daughters was one. One of my daughters wasn't born. My son wasn't born. I was 28. My wife was 29. My dad was 65. My mum was 62. And I took a photograph. Very bleached is the grass on that coast. That's how the years go. And they do, they seem to fly by so fast. And a number of years ago, when that programme Front Row first started on BBC Radio 4, they rang me up and said, it started in April. We said, we've lost a number of poets. If you can write a poem, that starts with the famous line, April is the cruelest month. I thought, oh, I, like, I like being asked to write things with a specific brief like that, so I thought, I'll have a go. And I thought, a lot of people would have done it in a kind of sensible way. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if you've got a dog called April is the cruelest month? And so I wrote this. And it's one of those ideas that you have, and you think it's a great idea, that about three verses in you think, what a ridiculous idea. But then I thought, I'll stick to it, I'll stick with it. So it's called April is the, it's called my dog. April is the cruelest month, might seem like a strange name for a dog. <laughs> and sometimes I think it is, when I'm shouting her name on the high moors in the driving wind. April is the cruelest month, I shout. April is the cruelest month. And my dog runs up to me, barking, wagging her tail. And I feel slightly, ever so slightly, embarrassed. But then, when people say, as they walk by me on the high moors in the driving wind, can a month bark? Can April wag its tail? I swell with pride because my dog's name is image and metaphor and poetry. So, April is the cruelest month, I shout, and April is the cruelest month, and the words roll round my mouth like Easter eggs in a shopping basket, which is the name of my cat. <laughs> <laughs> the strange thing was, <laughs> the weird thing was that it was the days of faxes, so I faxed that poem off to, to Radio 4, and they faxed back, and they said, only the first sheet appears to have come through. And so no, that's the entire work, I'm afraid. So, at this very moment, uh, Barnsley FC are playing Newcastle, probably winning 2 0 by now. And I, I, don't, I don't miss many games, but the, the season fixtures come out after I've booked my gigs in, which is fine. And our one season in the Premier League, 1997 to 98, what a fantastic year. Because Barnsley, as a place has had such a lot of kickings over the years from various governments and, and, and it's just, it's a town that tries its hardest to reinvent itself and when we got in the Premier League it was a great time and I wrote a poem about this, this friendly that we had at the start of the season and there used to be, a, I used to work a lot in Doncaster, I was a literature development worker in Doncaster and there was a, a, a Greek toilet attendant in the bus station toilet and he'd see me on telly and he used to call me television man 
And I got off pushing this here, television man! And he always used to let me, he used to cost you 20 pence for a weird Doncaster bus station. But he'd let me go in for nothing. And he'd always say the same joke. He'd go, come on, television man, this one's on me. And he'd go, not literally, television man. That was his joke. And I had to be, and him and Uncle Jack would have got on. And I went in, and then, when we got promoted to Premier League, he used to call me, is he a Premier League? And he always said, Premier League. And it was just a great thing. So I wrote a poem called Home Support which is again an older poem and it's just, you often see that sign on pubs when it means there's only home support can go in and it's just about those dreams that you have because what I love about sport is that you can often guess the end of a play or a film you can never guess the end of a, of a sporting event you know, because the, the team that you should beat beats you the team that should beat you, you beat it's, and I wish more poetry was like that I wish more poetry was you didn't know what was going to happen so it's called home support it's mid-July, 1997. It's hot. Barnsley are in the Premier League. And in my head, our season is laid out as simple as an underground map or a child's drawing of the solar system. Mid-July, a pre-season friendly against Doncaster. The start of something. And one of my daughters is coming to Doncaster on her own for the first time on the bus to meet me to go to the match. As the bus rolls into the bus station, I see her red shirt upstairs and she waves and my heart breaks for her and me and her red shirt with 21 Tinkler on the back and the bus driver who's a Middlesbrough fan and the other people who tumble off the bus in their red shirts with the season laid out in their heads, simple and lovely as a map of the solar system or a child's drawing of the underground and the Greek bus station toilet attendant who knows me and shouts Premier League but mostly it breaks for her and me and her red shirt. Still, it's July, it's hot. We meet Chris and Duncan and we try to go into a pub even though my daughter's a bit young and a man in a suit says, sorry, home support only. And my heart breaks for her and me and her red shirt and the home support who cheer Doncaster and whose season is laid out simple as a serving suggestion or a child drawing of a football team. But mostly, it breaks for her and me. We get a taxi home, which seems extravagant, but I think of the Greek toilet attendant, and I shout, Premier League, on our path, as we walk into the house. Father and daughter, red shirt, hot night, home support, season laid out in our heads, simple and lovely as a football programme, simple and lovely as a penalty kick or a well-taken corner. And to be honest with you, uh, that uh, pre-season friendly was probably the highlight of the entire season, <laughs> but there you go, that's life, that's what happens with football. And the other point, a new, a newish point uh, about getting older, it's about two things that I love very much. I'm a big fan of apples. I eat apples all the time. I love apples. I love what I call the feral apple, which is the apple grown from a tree you see at the side of the road where somebody's chucked a car out the, the car window. And yet there's a, near my house in Darfield, near Barnsley, there's two or three trees, and I often spend my time walking up and down, picking them up. So I'm a big fan of apples. The other thing I like is avant-garde jazz. Or as my wife calls it, haven't practiced. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I do love it. And the, the sound the guys are making is it's not it's a fantastic sound. And this is just bringing those two things together. And also, it's about growing older and the trouble, the thing that affects a lot of men our age, which is when you've had one too many cups of tea, that thing happens to you. And this is about the thing that happened to me. And it, I thought about my dad as well, who, who came to a sad end. And this is a bit about that. And uh, it also mentions a chap who drove past me in a car as I'm going to pick my apples up and he wound the window down and went, Ian McMillan? I went, yes. He said, you're on the television? I said, yeah. He said, on the radio? He said, you're on the radio? I said, yeah. He said, you write poems? I said, yes, I do. He said, you're shite. And he drove off. <laughs> I thought, God bless the working class. <laughs> can't live with him, can't live without him. So, and the poem's called, I've soiled my bricks, which is uh, some of the terrible, I know, I know, it's come to us all. And it's also trying to describe that music, because its music is so pure and beautiful. But it's so hard to describe, particularly the avant-garde. You know, people say things like, it sounds like a squeaky gate, or it sounds like a fire in a pet shop, I've already described as. Now, I'm always trying to think of new ways to describe it. Start with this. Kitchen light slattered through blinds on a Friday morning's opening statement of intent. Soundtrack is avant-garde jazz, squealing and groaning from an iPad's mouth. A man in armour is falling downstairs, it seems, and it's making him whistle and punch a cello. Ian's plunging the plunger on a pot of black coffee. The best bit of drinking it is plunging the plunger. Plunge Ian, wait now, let it stand. Try not to think of the apples. 
The slattered light alters slightly. Oh, it's the post lady with a parcel to sign for. What's that row, she says, nodding at the noise. He insigns. He's thinking of a reply, but she's gone. Poor slurp. Now he can think of the apples. Feral apples, he calls them. The ones you see hanging on trees by the side of the road, by the railway line, as the train slows down. Red and green stop and go signs you can make pies with. And today, Ian's going with a carrier bag from Aldi to pick some. Poor slurp. The jazz increases in volume and intensity. Now two alligators are fighting over the ownership of a gate that needs oiling. And that music forms a bumpy bridge to the next section of this poem where Ian is scrambling down to a hedge by the A635 between Darfield and Ardsley with his carrier bag. A passing artisan in a car shouts through an open window, your poem's a shite to the scrambling bard and a crow calls. Ian bends and picks red ferals from the floor, picks red ferals from a branch, ignores the feeling of tightness in a place he'd rather not think about. Ah, the joy of the feral apple collector and the avant-garde music fan. Carrier bagging the beauties as tractors fields away and that crow and apple landing in bag sounds combine to make a music that should, really should, win awards. Too much coffee. He needs a wee. So, let's let the avant-garde music swell again to take us to the next location for this poem. Actually, it's a double scene, so the music will resemble the mixing of Yorkshire puddings with the shattering of a stained glass window by a robot seagull. Scene, a village in the Scottish borders, my dad emerging with a smile and an up thumb from a toilet at the back of a garage. It's the mid-1970s, so the attendant still serves you, and one of them smiling. Dad's zip is still open. Scene. A hospital room. My dad is slumped. His stroke has stroked him, but not like a lover. He looks past me and says in a voice far away in the distance, I've soiled my breeks. Music is rising and now it's a storm at sea as described by a Martian. And it takes us to the next part of the poem where Ian is walking as fast as he can down the A635. A jogger passes and shouts, soon be time for a cuppa. The music stays under this next bit as Ian walks past her, thinking of dry things like deserts and sand dunes and boxes of dry, dry lentils. The post lady waves from her passing van, don't wave you bugger, give me a lift. Time is measured in water, I suppose. You start as a trickle of a stream in the high hills, and you grow and mature into a wide river, and people use you for pleasure and work, and they splash around in you, or they gaze into you, looking for reflections of themselves, and eventually you overflow your banks. You overflow your banks. You almost make it. You get to the door. It's locked. You stagger around the back into the garden. You almost make it. You are carrying red feral apples in an Aldi bag, and you almost make it. How much of an inland patio sea can a few cups of coffee make? More than you think. I've soiled my bricks. Let the music enter a thoughtful face. Let it sound like fruit. Yeah, I nearly made it. I got to the door and my wife had locked the door she was in the garden. And then it was, to the, the deed happened. And I wet myself and all the coffee went over the patio. And I went into my wife and I said, a terrible thing's happened. She said, what? She thought somebody had died. I says, I've wet my trousers. And she went, it happened to us all. <laughs> That's why I married her. Yes. Fantastic. I've got no idea what time it is, by the way. Um, so I told my wife I was only going to the shop. <laughs> and she'll wonder where I am, to be frank with you. Pardon? Nearly 25 past. Oh, we've got plenty of time. So what time do we finish? I've forgotten. Half, half past. About half past. All right, it's good. So I'll do one more little and then we'll get the band up and we'll do the one on our crown. Can I just say, this is such a great place to read poems in and I think Poets and Players are a fantastic organisation. And please keep coming to stuff that Poets and Players organise because I think they organise some fantastic, fantastic things. So I'll do two more, this little one. Again about uh, the way you get older and life goes on. And this is called Old Age. I'm 60 which isn't old but it gives you a kind of hint what it might be like. <laughs> A long way to go, I've got a long way to go. Thank you, sir. He doesn't look a day over 50, that fellow who said that. <laughs> so it's called old age. Old age is simply this. Put a penny on to do the pots, then forget. And put another penny on to do the pots. Penny on penny. Two penny morning. Penny penny fastened at the back. A penny on a penny. A double penny moment. And the pot's not done. And it's true, I stood there, I put a penny on, I put another penny on like that. And my wife came in and she went, you're wearing two pennies. I said, oh, that's why they wear them in Manchester. You know, that's how they wear them in Northern Quarter. No, they all wear two pennies at once in Northern Quarter. I said, that's how they do it. It's a Northern Quarter thing. So, 
I'll do one more little and then we'll get the band up. This is uh, <laughs> this is about me and my mate Tony Usman, who I do a lot of work with, and we were doing a gig in Retford, and we'd done this afternoon thing, and then he parked his car, and he went to this charity shop, he's always in charity shops, and he was spending ages thinking about buying this guitar. And when he come back with guitar, he turned out we got a ticket. And he was so cross, he started eating, playing like a, a song on guitar. It was like a response of art to the law. It was amazing. So it's called Tony Bought a Guitar and Got a Parking Fine. This happened in Redford. Trains passed through Redford at speed, but Tony and I had time to kill. Charity shops, a cafe where the silvery teapot reflected my face. Another charity shop, I flicked through paperbacks, Gervais Finn, Captain Corelli. But Tony saw the guitar, oh Tony, surely not, but he did. And by now it was ten past two, we rushed his guitar, twanged in the air. We got back to the car, just too late, too late. Tony shouted, there was unseasonal heat for October. He flung the parking ticket to the Redford floor and I opened my mouth and said a daft thing and my face turned red in the afternoon sun first silver now red trains passed through they're gone tony flailed at the strings in a heartbroken song tony kippered the strings in a heartbroken song tony rinsed out the strings in a heartbroken song tony light green the strings in a heartbroken song tony tea toweled the strings in a heartbroken song i was just trying to think of new words to describe tony hitting the strings so hard i thought tea towel is quite a good word for you give that guitar a right tea towel so, um, I'm going to do one more which involves the band. So, if you'd like to bring the band up, please welcome Blind Monk. Blind Monk the band, yeah, come on, Blind Monk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good band. So, what we'll do, fellas, I'll tell them a bit about the poem, and then we'll start, and then we'll do the poem, and people will pretend they were here who weren't tonight after this. <laughs> so, so, we were there that night, the Ian and Blind Monk played together. The poem is about me and my mate Dave Sutherland who were always big jazz fans and we used to listen to Voice of America playing jazz music when we were both in our early teens in the late 1960s, early 1970s that would be and we'd sit there listening to stuff and we thought that if we put the word jazz in front of anything it made it kind of sexy and cool so he said, do you want a jazz cup of tea? and I go, jazz I will and he go, I've got any jazz biscuits and his mum went out to play at chapel at the, at the organ at the chapel. And so while she's out, we're listening to Voice of America. And we sat with that in dark. And we thought every once an hour the bus went past and it turned the corner and it lit up the room with the headlights. And we pretended we were in a jazz club. <laughs> and it features this Thelonious Monk tune. Uh, God, where's, where's it gone? Hang on. Ugly Beauty. Yeah. yeah. So if the band wants to start, then I'll read this, and uh, we've never done this before, I think it'll be a triumph. Another Friday evening, in Dave Sunderland's front room, Another new LP bought in the jazz section of Casa Disco. Another night when Dave's man was out at the chapel. Turn it up, Dave. Turn it right up. Turn the lights out, Dave, and let's wait. Another track on the underground album, Ugly Beauty. Another rearrangement of time and space and coincidence. Another listen, Dave. Put it on again, mate. Soon be time. In the front room dark, we try to snap our fingers, but it sounds like rain on a shed roof. Another few moments to wait. If the 14 bus is on time. Another double-decker modern jazz moment. Another adolescent evening spent wishing we could leave here. Round the corner, by the station inn. The 14 bus. Thelonious Monk's music redefines so much. The 14 bus's lights light up the room, sweep over it, away. Another hour to wait before the next bus, Dave. Another biscuit from the tin. Let's pretend it's a jazz biscuit. Another magical moment, Dave. Thelonious. 
to 14, the light. Play it again till your mum comes in. She said she was bringing chips and mushy peas. We'll pretend they're jazz peas, Dave. Jazz peas. <laughs> Time for a member of the Poison Players Committee to do a formal vote of thanks and offer me and Mona a small bouquet. <laughs> a small bouquet. 